reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in body I do not know, or whether out of body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in body or out of body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh which was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing I pleaded with the Lord three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for loving us. What a gift you gave us, Lord supreme sacrifice, your life for our saving of the sins and the death that was to come. We thank you, Lord, for that gift. Be with us now as we hear God's word presented by Pastor Gary, and just prepare our hearts, my minds, our minds. May they be open, Lord, to what you want to teach us. But most of all, Lord, may we be submissive and apply it to our lives. We thank you, Lord, for loving us so much. Bless this service. In our Savior's name we pray. Amen. You can be seated, folks. Well, good morning. (laughs) Have nice smiles on your faces this morning. Praise the Lord. We ought to be able to smile in God's house, right, no matter how the pressures of the world are closing in and the difficulties, we can still have a good time and rejoice here in the Lord together. Those are great scriptures that were were read, and I think today is probably one of the most important lessons, and my daughter used to say to me, oh, Dad, you say they're all important just to get people to come. And I said, well, they are all important, but some of them kind of grab a hold of my heart more than others, and we're really going to be talking about the subject of humility today uh, as we look at the fifth lesson uh, in this series, Six Foolish Things That Christians Do to Stunt Their Growth, as we look at bitter or better, which is number five in this series, and I believe this is the one that will really help for power to be demonstrated and available to us uh, in, our, in our lives as we think a little bit about humility. This story that Michael read is an interesting and almost unbelievable story. The Apostle Paul basically says, I knew a man. I knew of a man, and yet because he had been humbled By Almighty God, he was not going to identify that man as being himself. But most scholars, most theologians, uh, I personally believe and have believed for years, most believers believe that it was certainly the Apostle Paul who was speaking here. He might have been caught up into the third heaven when he was stoned at Lystra and dragged from the city. We're not sure, and what he heard and what he saw 
perhaps was there from Almighty God to encourage him and motivate him as he continued with the Lord. He was caught up into the third heaven. And we have described before that the Bible talks about three different heavens. The first heaven you look at is the heavens where the birds fly. The second heaven would be where you would notice the moon and the stars and the sun. And the third heaven is described in the word of God as the place where God resides. And that is where this mortal man, the Apostle Paul, was caught up to be to encourage, to excite, to motivate. And yet with his great skills and his background and his knowledge of the word of God, and certainly now being in heaven with God, a messenger is allowed to come, is sent, a messenger of Satan, allowed by God to give forth a thorn in the flesh to the Apostle Paul. Now it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that a thorn in the flesh is not a positive thing. Think of the word thorn. Think of the word flesh. Think about pruning rose bushes and sticking your hand into the midst of a rose bush and being pricked by a thorn. It is never a pleasant thing. He receives a thorn in the flesh and most believe that it was some type of an eye ailment. In fact, if you're taking any notes on your bulletin today, you can write down Galatians 4 and verse 15, the last part of the verse, because Paul basically says to the churches of Galatia, you would have given your own eyes for me. So here was Paul, who was a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, sat at the feet of a doctor of the law, someone who had the entire Old Testament memorized, Someone who was a great orator, very eloquent, had a great command of communication, and God gave him a thorn in the flesh to remind him every day that he was a man, that he was flesh, and that he needed to depend on the Lord every day for everything in his life. But Paul was like us. He prayed three times that the thorn would be removed. You have thorns in your life, and I have thorns in my life, and we pray that they would be removed. But God said to Paul, no, no, no. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Never are we in a better place than when we are weak and we are drawing on the grace of Almighty God. Some of the worst times we go through are times of abundance, times where we have it all, times where everything is working out perfectly, and sometimes we push aside God and his presence and his provision. Foolish thing number five, Christians allow disappointments and tragedy to make them bitter rather than better. But Paul gets on board. And in verse 10, when he hears that he'll be stronger because of this thorn in the flesh and his weakness and the power of God being upon him, he says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. I wonder how often we really think that way. But that's how Paul thought, and it seems like the formula for success. Yesterday morning, as I was doing um, my devotion, Karen and I were doing our devotion together. Sometimes I'm writing and jotting down stuff when I'm supposed to be listening to the scripture they're reading or the illustration that they're giving, because something just comes to mind as, wow, this would be great for a sermon. The speaker yesterday on Our Daily Bread he talked about an axolotl, which was a biological enigma, an extinct, almost extinct, species of salamander that was nearly extinct in Mexico. I guess it's still there, but very few of them. 
This salamander maintains tadpole-like characteristics throughout its life. Almost like it's in infancy, but it's that way its entire way, its entire journey of maturity. And the thought is by many as they examine this biological enigma is that it depicts the fear of growth. Almost like Peter Pan. If you've seen the Geico commercial, I want to slap that kid. You know? <laughs> Just to stay young, never to grow, never to be responsible. With growth comes pain and comes responsibility and causes us to have to be responsible with the knowledge that we have received. Bitter or better? A topic about humility. I want to read a couple of very brief quotes to you about humility. The first one is by St. Augustine. It says, the sufficiency of my merit is to know that my merit is not sufficient. That's pretty good. Tryon Edwards said, true humility is not an abject, groveling, self-despising spirit, but is but a right estimate of ourselves as God sees us. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, humility is to make a right estimate of oneself. So it's not crawling around and telling everyone what a worm you are. It's a right estimation of who you are in light of who God is. Humility. Lighten said, If thou would find much favor and peace with God and man, be very low in thine own eyes. Forgive thyself little and others much. Another theologian said, Plenty of people wish to become devout, but no one wishes to be humble. Ezra Taft Benson said, Pride is concerned with who is right. Humility is concerned with what is right. And finally, a great writer, author said, Humility is royalty without the crown. Humility is royalty without the crown. Why does God allow certain things to happen? Anyone ever ask you? Have you ever asked that question? Why are these things happening to me? Why am I being placed in a situation that seems impossible and I feel so weak and I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel? Why are these things happening? Well, a couple of things, if you want to mark them down, maybe they'll be of some help to you. Psalm 25 and verse 9 says this, The humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. Don't you want to know the way of God? The only way we will receive the way of God is to be humble, not filled with ourself, but seeking out the answers and the justice of God. 1 Corinthians 2.14 states, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him, for they are spiritually discerned. It would seem that humility leads to spirituality, that we could receive from God, that we would know how he operates, that we would even gain a little sense of why and what he is doing. And just to paraphrase Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, if you want to write that down, tells us God's ways are not our ways. His ways are above our ways. So we're not always going to get it. We're not always going to understand. But if it places us in a place of humility with a humble spirit, God's power will rest upon us. And never are we in a better place. Now some questions and some statements that we're going to cover this morning just a little bit that will help you when you're deciding, gee, do I get bitter? Do I get better? Do I get connected to this thing called humility, which will lead me always in the right direction? 
will ask some things and make some statements. Number one, how can God use this to produce humility in me? What I'm going through right now, it stinks. I don't like it. It doesn't feel good. But how will God use this to create humility or produce humility in me? Moses was the meekest man to ever walk the face of the earth. He went through a lot. And the few things he did in losing his cool, you know, striking a rock, he received some pretty sharp judgment for those things. And yet he, he continued to be a humble man. James 4, 6 says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. 1 Peter 5 and verse 5, the last part of the verse, says, yes, all of you be submissive one to another and clothe yourselves with humility. Did everybody get dressed spiritually this morning? We need to. Uh, I walk out, I got up at about quarter to five this morning, walked out to the living room in my pajamas, and they didn't match real well. There were stripes and paisleys, you know, and uh, didn't match well at all, but fell to my knees at the couch because you, I know who I am. I know what I need. I know that I'm weak. And I know that I need God's grace and his humility to be a better man. And I don't even want to get involved in false humility. You know, we walk around telling people the humble things we did and the humble attitude we have, which is all pride. We want to make sure that we see ourselves in the light of God and who he is. Jesus and what he did. Read the Gospels. Get excited over your Savior and the grace and the humility that he gives for Christian wear, the stuff we put on spiritually every morning. Pride caused Satan to sin, to fall. He was the anointed cherub that covers. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. He had pipes showing that he ministered at the throne of God with beautiful music. He was arrayed with beautiful stones and he would cover the very throne of God, as though he were protecting it, not that God needed protection, but that was his function, to be at the throne of God. And yet he looked, and he saw the worship that God was receiving, and he said, I want to be like him. I want to ascend upward to the mountain of God. And because of pride, he was cast out of heaven. And Jesus told his disciples, he beheld Satan being cast out of heaven like lightning as Satan was cast out. What about Adam and Eve and their sin? Wanting to know it all, wanting to have it all, thinking God was holding out on them. All they needed was humility and trust in what God had told them to do. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. They fell, and the human race fell because of pride. I would challenge you folks, I've challenged myself, every sin we get involved in originates in pride. It really does. And we should get on our knees when we find ourselves doing the wrong things and say, Lord, I'm being prideful. Lord, I'm putting myself first. Lord, forgive me and help me to view myself in the light of who you are. The Bible says only by pride comes contention. I think I should read that again. Only by pride comes contention. We wouldn't have any contention if there was not pride in our lives. Isn't that a good thing to know? Because again, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The second thing. It's only by humility and the fear of the Lord that we obtain the most important things in life. You'd have to think to yourself, what do you think the most important things in life are? I guess it depends on how old you are. I guess it depends on whether you're a male or a female. I guess it depends on where you live and what your circumstances are. But some things are the same. 
across the board if you read the word of God concerning what it is that's important. Proverbs 22 and verse 4 says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Did you ever think those things were the most important things? Riches, honor, and life. Remember Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon was a philosopher. He was a journalist. Solomon walked about with a little daytimer, I suppose. Surveying life, circumstances, happiness, heartache, comparing situations and people, trying to find happiness, trying to find contentment, trying to ask the question, why? And every time he looked at stuff, he came to the conclusion that it was vanity. It was emptiness. It didn't really match up to what a human being really needs. You know, there are a lot of poor people who have embraced the Savior and they're very happy. They're very content. They're very satisfied. They're very giving. I have found in 30 plus min years of ministry that the best givers in the churches are the poor people. Why is that? Because they have already received the most important things. And they know it. And what a blessing that is. Solomon came to the conclusion in Ecclesiastes 12.13, the conclusion of the matter, fear God and keep his commandments. Paul made a couple of brief statements that I hope will get your attention this morning. Humility statements. He said, I am the least of the apostles. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 9. He said, I am the very least of all the saints. Ephesians 3.8. And he said, I am the foremost of sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15. I read that and I say, Lord, I beg to differ with him. Have you ever felt that way? He's the worst. I know he persecuted the church. He wreaked havoc in the church. I know he imprisoned people and probably killed some. I still don't know if he was the worst of sinners, but this is the inspired word of God. And he says that he was. All statements of humility. And yet God called him up into the third heaven to encourage him and bless him and to give him his further marching orders. You've all probably heard of a missionary to China named Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was the guest speaker of a church in uh, Melbourne, Australia. He got up to speak in this Presbyterian church and the pastor was thrilled that Hudson Taylor was there and he gave him quite an introduction. Some men just don't like long, eloquent introductions, especially when they're humble. I remember trying to give an introduction to Dayton over here and he about hip-butted me from behind the pulpit and said, okay, 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 bye-bye. <laughs> You know, and uh, got up and did his thing. Well, Hudson Taylor listened to this eloquent introduction. And when the pastor got done talking about what he had done in China and what a marvelous servant of God he was, he introduced him finally as our illustrious speaker. Hudson Taylor walked over and he stood quietly for a moment. Let me put my glasses on because this is what he said. He said, dear friends... I am the little servant of an illustrious master. And uh, not quite sure how the pastor felt after that, but it was probably a mild rebuke in his direction. Listen, we're just weak little men and women, but we have an illustrious master. We have a great God. And he's mindful of us with all of our sin, and he says, be humble. Have a humble spirit. Because when you're prideful and when you think it's all about you, I'm going to resist you and not give you what you truly need, the best things in life. The third thing, what character traits will be developed if I respond correctly to this? Turn with me. I know you know it. I know that you've probably memorized Romans 8.28 a long time ago. Maybe not Romans 8.29. But I want to read it anyway. Let's turn there. Romans 8. And verses 28 and 29. Becoming better, not bitter. Obtaining 
humility. When I go through this stuff, how will God develop me and my character traits? Romans 8, 28 and 29 says, and we know, that cracks me up, and we know, that was Paul knew, that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I'm going to read 30. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. So some possible answers to what character traits will be developed if I respond correctly to hard things in my life. Anybody here have hard stuff in their life? You know? Nobody. Just me. Scott and Scott. You know? Okay. I know we get nervous. We think it's a trick question. We think maybe the pastor will weigh what really is hard and rebuke you if you lift your hand and it isn't really that hard. You know? Uh, I'm just being honest with you and saying, do you have hard things? And it could be hard to you. It might not be hard to me. That doesn't matter what it is to me. It's your life. And God, thank God, looks at us and he knows what's hard for me might not be hard for you. And he deals with me according to my personality. And he deals with you according to your personality. That's a great God. That's a loving Savior. So here are some of the things. Will I learn patience through this? You going through anything today where God is teaching you humility so you'll end up better and not bitter? Will that thing help you to learn patience? Will I be more grateful for the things that I now take for granted? What I'm going through right now. What you're going through right now. Will you be more grateful than the things you now take for granted? Will, I, will it motivate me to develop endurance? James 1.4, let patience have its perfect work that ye may be complete, entire, lacking nothing. And then will it make me more alert and discerning? See, folks, it's not always about how we feel. How this is affecting me and what I'm going through and what I think and where I'm hurting and what people don't understand. It's not always about that. Sometimes it's about others. Sometimes it's about down the road and helping somebody else. Sometimes it's a mild rebuke from the Lord so that we will learn something. The issues of life. And the fourth thing, and you might be surprised I'm saying this one, but I think everybody in here should be a leader in some capacity. You might lead one. You might lead five. You might lead a family. You might lead a small group. You might lead a church. You might lead a husband or a wife or somebody that lives next to you. Is this preparation for future leadership and service what I'm going through right now? Now, I'm not going to look this one up right now, but 1 Peter 4, verses 12 to 14 says we're not to view suffering as a strange occurrence. It's a normal thing. It comes with life. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You know what Peter was inspired to say in 1 Peter 4, 16? Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God on this behalf. So, you know, I'm going through stuff. I'm suffering. Don't be worried about it. Don't be ashamed. Glorify God that you're going through something. God is teaching you something. Maybe it's preparation for future leadership and service. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 12. 2 Timothy 2.12 says, If we endure, we shall reign with him. If we endure, we shall reign with him. Hey, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season ye shall reap, if you faint not. Some examples in the Bible. 
Joseph, did he go through some stuff that could have made him bitter? The last time you were thrown in a hole. When's the last time you were accused of some sexual sin that you did not commit? When's the last time that you were imprisoned and forgotten there? Did he end up better? Ended up being the number two man in Egypt, really in our book, the number one man in Egypt because of God's grace upon his life. What about Daniel? He could have been bitter. How do you feel when someone looks at you and says, you're not to pray anymore except to the king? Daniel said, I hear you. Usually when you're going to do your own thing. Marched upstairs three times a day, faced Jerusalem and still prayed like he always did. We would feel spiritual if we marched upstairs and slid underneath our bed and continued to pray. We'd say, praise God, I'm still praying. He did what he always had done. There's the window. He put his arms right on the window so that the whole city could see him as he faced Jerusalem because he was doing what he did for God. And God always blesses that. What about Job? Boy, he could have been bitter. And I think he got dangerously close many times, but he ended up better, didn't he? And God blessed him. And if you want to know his character, just read Job 1.1 sometimes. They exercised, they understood humility that when they were weak, that's when they were, in fact, strong. Now, Christ states, as I've already said, in the world you'll have tribulation. Nobody likes that. Nobody prays for that. Nobody embraces that. Nobody rejoices or does their happy dance, so to speak. But it's coming, or it's come, or you're in the middle of it right now. And God says, never have you been in a better place. Do you believe that? You know, we ought to pass the microphone around and do some testimonies. Do you really believe that the hard place you're in is the best place you could be in? Because you will draw on God if you do the right thing. God will give you answers. God does not want you to figure it out all on your own. God wants you to have humility and his power will rest on you. John 17, Christ's high priestly prayer. Christ said, Father, keep them in the world, but keep them from evil and temptation. Folks, are you bitter? Sometimes bitterness comes from anger that has not been dealt with. The Bible calls it a root of bitterness. Bitterness goes deep. So we have to be careful that we're humble and we ask what God is teaching us. What is your perspective this morning? What is God attempting to teach us? I'll go back to one of the little humility statements I made. Humility is royalty without a crown. Humility is royalty without a crown. You know how we are. We'd say, I'm royalty, where's my crown? Right? Who took my crown? Where is it? Humility is royalty without a crown. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Heads bowed and eyes closed. We'll be ending a little bit differently today because of communion. But right now, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, this is a very serious topic. Friends, I want you to throw something out the window. The statement, I feel like. Or it seems to me. Or in my estimation. We don't know what the right thing is. We don't always know what God is trying to do. But when you're in a place that seems a little unstable, or it seems a little chaotic, or hurtful, or distressing, it's actually a good place to be because you'll draw on God rather than try to gather the answers for yourself. Maybe you're here today and you say, I'm in a place right now, Pastor Gara, that I'm dangerously close to being bitter. And I don't want to be because it's actually a good place to draw on God and learn humility. Please pray for me today. Please pray for me. I won't call out your name. I just want to pray for you. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hands. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? 
I'm dangerously close. I, I know that uh, I'm seeking out answers and sometimes I come to my own conclusions and that's not necessarily of the Lord. Pray for me today. I want to be better. I see your hand. I want to be better. I don't want to be better. I see your hand. Pastor, I'm going through a rough time today and I just appreciate your prayers. By my uplifted hand, would you pray for me? Hands all over. It's a tough world. We need the Lord. We need His grace. Pastor, something touched my heart today through the Word of God or a statement made, something that I hadn't thought of before and God kind of drove it home and pray that I'll think on it more and develop it by His grace. Anybody like that? God just brought something to mind. Thank you, dear lady. Thank you. Good. Father, we think we know what to do in every situation, and we think that we have become great discerners of what all the answers are concerning the circumstances that come into our lives. Father, we don't know that much. We're sheep. And the best thing we can know is the sound of our shepherd's voice. Thank you that your Holy Spirit brings to mind the words of the Savior. And Father, might we be no different. Lord, we do seek after answers. But the greatest thing we seek after is humility and a relationship with you. Help us not to compare ourselves with others. Help us, Lord, to realize that we have a perfect, loving God that if, that if you kept score, if you had resentments, if you had bitterness, we'd be in so much trouble. Thank you that you love us and you're merciful and you seek to grow us up that we might be mature believers which will help spill over into the lives of others. Thank you for your grace now. Help us to be better, not bitter. Help us to see that humility developed by your Holy Spirit as we surrender to it. We ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.